Take your Bibles tonight. Open up with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and just put a marker here, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tonight. I have to admit something that may come as a surprise to you. I like sarcastic t-shirts. You know the slogans and stuff that are on sarcastic t-shirts? I just, I enjoy them. I figure if you wear a t-shirt that has writing on it, you're wanting somebody to read it. And there's different times you just shake your head and snicker, and it's, it's funny. Uh, the old lady Maxine, you know who I'm talking about, that character? There is a t-shirt with her on it, and it says, I'm a grumpy old lady. I'm allergic to stupidity, and I break out in sarcasm. That just tickles me. There's another t-shirt, big letters across the front, it says social distancing. And then in smaller letters underneath, it says, if you can read this, you're too close. Another one says common sense is like deodorant. The people who need it the most never use it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I like this one. It says there's no need to repeat yourself. I ignored you just fine the first time. <laughs> And then the last one I found was for the Apostle Paul. I, I think he probably had this on one of his robes stenciled in somehow. It says, I would like to apologize to anyone that I have not offended. Please be patient. I will get to you shortly. <laughs> Some of you might get a little bent sideways over the suggestion that a Bible character would ever get sarcastic. And yet, as we look tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, we are going to see three times that the Apostle Paul was sarcastic. As he's dealing with this church, now I'm not suggesting that sarcasm is the, uh, ought to be the normal way in which we talk to people. But you got to remember, the Apostle Paul has dealt with a lot of things with this church. And if there has ever been a thick-headed congregation, it was this congregation in Corinth. And there was times when the Apostle Paul would say something, and he, he, here we are, we're at chapter 12, we are almost finished with 2 Corinthians. And he is still having to defend himself. And so three times he, he throws out these little sarcastic barbs at them and then reels it back in. The point is not to insult the people, but it's to get their attention. And so as we look at this tonight, chapter 12, verse 11, it says, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. <laughs> it, I don't know. I read that and that just tickles me. Let me give you, I'm going to give you the sarcastic point that he makes, and then I'm going to give you the point that he was trying to make to get through to them. The first sarcasm is this. He says, Forgive me this wrong. In other words, I'm sorry that I didn't burden you. Paul has had to keep defending his apostleship, but it hasn't been with a bunch of words. Although he has defended himself with words, he has shown them the actions of what an apostle is supposed to do. He has lived among these people. He has worked among these people. He has expressed to them through his actions and through his words, his love for them as an apostle. He has done all these things. As an apostle, the apostle Paul had every right to be supported by this church at Corinth. But he didn't because there were people in the church that were making accusations against him. And we're going to see those here in just a moment. And so to this church, they are questioning whether or not he's really an apostle. He says, I have done everything for you that an apostle ought to do. The only thing that I haven't done is burden you. I'm sorry for that. Can you hear the little sarcasm, the little dig to this church? Now, the bite is there for a purpose. Let's look at his point. The point, verses 14 and 15, he says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. The point that he's trying to make, he's going to make four points here under this first sarcasm that he zings them with. The first point is this. He says, I'm not here for what I can get out of you. I'm here for you. I'm not here for what I can get out of you. I am here for you. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look with me at verse 33. Again, 
In the first letter that he writes to this church, Paul says, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now, this sets Paul's ministry apart from perhaps other people in their ministries. They maybe came in, and, it, and it's no different today. There are those that it seems incredibly obvious that the only reason that they're doing the ministry that they're doing is so that they can extract something out of the people. They are trying to get the money out of the people. They are trying to get the, the power out of the people, all these kinds of things. They're not in it for what they can do for the people. And Paul says, here's the point I've been trying to make to you. I'm not here to get something out of you. And, and it's, I just kind of picture him saying, people, don't you get it? I have never once tried to get something out of you. I'm here for you. I want to give to you. I want to be a benefit for you. The second thing that he says is dads lay up for their kids, not the other way around. Is it the job of children to pay the bills of their parents? Absolutely not. It is the job of the parents to take care of the children. That's the way it ought to be. That's the natural order of things. The Apostle Paul sees himself as the spiritual father to these people. And you say, well, Paul took money from, from other people. He took money from other churches. He took support from them. That's right. But what was the, one of the biggest problems that this church had from the very beginning? They were carnal. They couldn't understand what it was to be an adult Christian. They were still babes in Christ. And Paul says, because I am your spiritual father and you are still children, I'm taking care of you. I'm not expecting you to take care of me. Those other churches, he didn't come out and say it this way, but those other churches had a level of maturity that they understood that their role was to support his work. That's the way it should have been. But to this church, they weren't able to handle that. They were still children. He says, then I'm still your dad and I'm going to take care of you. The third thing that he says to them, the point, is that I will spend and be spent for you. This is a great level of commitment to the people. I will spend and be spent for you. And this becomes even greater when you consider the last point under this. He says, the more that I love you, the less you love me. The more that I love you, the less that you love me. Our service in the work of the Lord is not based upon whether or not I feel appreciated. It is not based on whether or not we got the pat on the back that we think that we deserve. It's not based on being recognized for our years of service. It is not based on being shown reciprocal acts of love. That is not what it's about. And if that's what it's about for you, then you're doing it wrong. It's supposed to be about loving regardless of whether you're loved back. Because what you are doing is in service for the Lord, not for the pat on the back and the praise of the people. As I got to thinking about that, <clears throat> you do what you're doing. Your various ministries throughout the church, you do what you do because you love the people. And can each of us tonight, I'm not, I'm not asking you to say amen, I'm not asking you to nod your head in agreement, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, I'm asking you. Whatever your ministry is, regardless of what it is, is it a ministry because you love the people? Or is it because you're looking for something? Paul says, I'm not here looking for something, I'm just here to love. You know, think about it this way. What if this coming Wednesday night, our, we're life leaders, our Olympian leaders, gopher leaders, nursery workers back there, if they got toddlers that can understand what's being said, what if time was just taken out and started something like this? I want you to know why I do what I do here. It is not because it's a position in the church, because my name is on a line item in the, the list of officers. I'm here because I love you. And if the group is small enough, maybe take time and go around the room and say, I love you, Joey. I love you, Susie, because. And this is why. This is what I love about you. What a difference that would make. What a difference it would make if next Sunday in the Sunday school class, teachers started out a class with an affirmation of love for their students, that we are here teaching not because it's a job that has to be done, has to be fulfilled, but I'm doing this because I love you, because I care about you, because one of my greatest joys is being able to stand 
and to teach God's word, the word that I love, to people that I love. What a difference it would make before we left here tonight if you found ushers, greeters, musicians, uh, people that do the special music, uh, people that serve in the nurseries, the various positions, the sound guy, the person sitting beside you. If you just looked at them tonight after the service was over and said, you know what, before we leave this place tonight, I want you to know I love you. I am so glad you're my brother and my sister. I am so glad we're in this church together. You know, tonight, I can honestly say from my wife and I that we love you folks. And it is a privilege to serve this church family. It's a privilege to be here. Could we be other places? Sure. Do we want to be other places? No. Because this is where God's put us. This is the family that God's put within our hearts. And this is the people that we love. You know, that makes the difference. And Paul's trying to get this through to these people. Yeah, he's had to be pretty tough on them. He has had to really uh, say some hard things. And they just, they, all they do is they get their backs up, they get offended, they keep shooting off their mouths back at him. And finally he says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't burden you. You got everything else that, the, that an apostle gives to the churches, but I didn't burden you, I'm so sorry. Oh, can you see them? As he said that kind of, oh. Sometimes you got to get a person to suck in their breath to make them shut up. And that's what that little sarcastic zinger does. It makes them go, oh. and now Paul can, he can get in there. Here's the second sarcasm. Chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, verse 16. He says, but be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. So the second sarcasm says, yep, I tricked you. Because evidently, as you continue to read this, you can kind of piece some things together. Evidently, there were some people that were saying, yeah, Paul, you maybe didn't take money directly from us, but you sent Titus in. You sent some of your lackeys in, and they collected money for Jerusalem. Paul, is Jerusalem your middle name? Why, they must have been bringing that money to you, and Paul says, yep, I tricked you, you caught me. And it was just a sarcastic zinger to get them to go, oh so that he could give them the point, verses 17 and 18. Did I make a gain of you by any of them which I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Bottom line, Paul says, I took nothing from you. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 20. This is something I wonder if Paul didn't face from other churches, some accusations he faced from others, because in Acts chapter 20, to this uh, fledgling church of Ephesus, he says in verse 33 of Acts 20, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or peril. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. But he says of myself, you know, these hands have supported the ministry. There was many times where the Apostle Paul, he was a bivocational evangelist. He would go into town, sometimes we'll use the term a tent builder. And he would go into a town, he would find work to do to take care of his needs while still taking time off to preach and do things like that. So he had ways to support himself. There was absolutely nothing wrong with that. These accusations that were leveled against him, Paul says once again, I took nothing. Go back to 2 Corinthians again with me. 2 Corinthians again, chapter 12, verse 19. And he says here, again, Think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. The final sarcasm that's given. He says, you think we've be, been defending ourselves to you. And he says, that's not the case. The point is, think again, we answer to God. This is who we ultimately answer to. As you serve the Lord and as you do things for the Lord, you are always going to have somebody that's going to climb your clock for something. And somebody's always going to get upset with you about something. 
And you know what? Sometimes it's enough to make you want to just throw your hands up and say, I'm done, I quit. I mean, this ain't worth it. To have somebody on my case all the time, I quit. Paul could have done that. and Boy, I would think if anybody was ever justified to do that, it sure was Paul. But Paul didn't do that. You want to know why? Because Paul says to that church, he says, I don't answer to you. I answer to God. That's who I answer to. And tonight, Christian, you do not answer to me. You don't answer to that person sitting beside you, even though tonight after church you're going to tell them how much you love them. Amen? But you don't answer to them. You answer to God. Go with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14, look at verse 12. In Romans 14 and verse 12, the Bible says, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Wow. I mean, that's something pretty important to think about. We have to give an account of ourselves to God someday. That is something that every one of us has a responsibility to do. Everything Paul has said to this church has been for their edifying. He is trying to build them up. He is trying to help this body of believers along. You would expect Paul, as he finishes out what he is going to say to this church, going back to 2 Corinthians, you would expect Paul to finish out by naming off some of the most egregious sins that could have been committed. And that is not what happens. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look with me, if you will, at verse 20. As he says, we answer to God, he says, I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not. Lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you. And that I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. As Paul recognizes that he is going to answer to God someday for himself, not to this church. He knows that he is going to answer for God for the things that he has addressed to this church. The things that he has said to these people. What has he said to them? You would think he would name off a list of absolutely egregious sins. That if he comes back and he finds them doing it, because remember in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians was at chapter uh, 5 or chapter 7, where there is incest going on in the church. I would call that pretty egregious, wouldn't you? And you would think he would name that, but he doesn't. Notice the sins that he names. First of all, in verse 20, he says debates, debates. Albert Barnes says our word debate does not commonly imply evil. It denotes commonly discussion or elucidating truth, or maintaining a proposition. But he says the word in the original meant contention, strife, altercation, connected with anger and heated zeal. That's what happens when you start debating with individuals. And he says, if I come back here and I find you debating, there's going to be a problem. The next one is envying. Well, we don't have to have that explained. We know what envying is. Then the next one is wrath. Wrath is hot tempers. Uh, that's scary to think about that in a church, people with hot tempers. But if you remember, uh, Charles Stanley tells about when he first started pastoring there at uh, First Baptist in Atlanta, Georgia, that I think it was one of the deacons came up and cold-cocked him right in the front of the church. That's called a hot temper. Uh, and it would have been worse if he had just socked him one right back and they would have had a boxing match right there in the at the front, you know, right on the communion table, just bang somebody's head off the table kind of thing. That's not what happened. He got slugged and the deacon walked away. So strife is another one that's mentioned. Strife is literally partisanship. Partisanship is a political word. We understand that in our culture today. Sides have developed around a group, an individual or a personality, rather than Scripture. Partisanship is something that ought not to take place in the church. We can't have spiritual politics. The next two, backbiting, whispering. Albert Barnes, again, differentiates between these. He says, whisperers declare secretly and with great reserve the supposed faults of others. Backbiters proclaim them publicly and avowedly. 
backbiting and whispering. They're, they're cousins to one another. He says that's something he doesn't want to find out that they're doing. Swellings. The word swelling is conceit, inflated ego, being full of themselves. He says, I don't want to hear about that. And then tumults. Again, political instability. It goes back to that whole strife thing. The political instability within the church. We look at these and we say, well, I agree that these things aren't good. I agree that they shouldn't be in the church. But particularly wicked, I don't know about that. Well, as you continue reading verse 21, Paul puts them into the same category as uncleanness, fornication, and lasciviousness. Those are the heinous things he was dealing with them back in 1 Corinthians. And he says, if I come and visit you and I find these things going on, this big list that he gives, and then three other things from chapter or from 1 Corinthians, he says, I will have to be such as I don't want to be around you. And he says, I will bewail many which have sinned and have not repented. Paul puts himself in a position where he tries to get a hold of this church's attention and to say, look, God's grace has given me a message to tell you this is how you grow in the Lord. And the only way that you're going to grow in the Lord is to get these things out of your life. And you got to listen. you got to listen to what I'm trying to tell you, he says. So many times people won't listen. So Paul has to be blunt. Our problem is, is that too often we're about as blunt as a ball bat, and we keep swinging the ball bat bludgeoning people. Paul didn't do that. He didn't do that. You know what's interesting is that everything that Paul said even his sarcastic comments. He went in with the zinger, he came back with the point, and again reaffirmed the mother love. How many times does Paul remind this church how much he loves them, how much he cares for them, that everything he says is said out of a heart of love for these people? Christians, we have to make sure that we have a heart of love and compassion for others, even those that we disagree with. We have got to make sure that we have that. Not just that we say, well, yeah, I have that. We actually convey it. Well, I do. I know I do. Can the other person see it? And if you say, well, I don't know if they can see it or not, ask them. And if they say, no, I can't see it. I don't see that as love. Okay? Might want to back up a step. Might want to make sure that we're coming in with the kind of love that the Apostle Paul shows to this unruly bunch of people. But do you have any doubt tonight that Paul loved them? Any doubt at all? No. May it be said of us that we love one another, that we love our Sunday school class, that we love our, our teachers and in, in Olympians, we love our teachers in Word of Life, we love our nursery workers, we love our greeters, our ushers, our people that fill the various positions throughout the church, that we love one another. May that be something that marks us here at First Baptist. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the most important thing that you need to know tonight is not that I love you or that somebody sitting beside you loves you, but that Jesus loves you. That's what you got to know, because as much as I love you and the person sitting beside you loves you, none of us can save you. Jesus can, and Jesus will, if you will come to him in repentance and faith, believing, calling upon his name to be saved. Jesus Christ loves you so much that he took your sins upon himself at Calvary and died upon a cross. And he was buried in that tomb. And he did it for you. He did it for me. And he wants to save your soul tonight, but Jesus is not going to force himself upon you. He stands at the door and just politely knocks. And tonight, I don't know, is there conviction going on in your heart? You're here without Christ as Savior. Is there conviction going on where you say, I don't know Christ as Savior, but... Something inside of me is saying, I need to get this settled tonight. I'll tell you what, that's the Holy Spirit. If something is inside you telling you, ah, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, that's the devil talking. It's time to tell the devil to shut up, and I'm going to listen to what the Lord has to say. Will you come to Christ tonight? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. And Lord, we thank you that as we read Paul's words, we... Even though, Lord, he uh, hits them with some of these sarcastic things to get them to be quiet, to listen. 
Lord, he still then swoops back in and verbally wraps his arms around him. If he was there physically, he would do it physically, but verbally wraps his arms around him and lets him know this is for their good. That he's just trying to help them. And we thank you, Lord, for such grace that is shown even in the midst of bluntness. Father, tonight, if there is one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, we pray that they would sense your call on their life, the love that you have for them, and that tonight might be the night that they would respond to the gospel. We ask it in Jesus' name.